good Wednesday morning and uh, I'm dressed a little casual today because it's uh, going to be another warm day in Sacramento uh, I'm busy actually uh, uh, Wednesdays are kind of a busy day I always have phone meetings and 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 things like that and uh, all involving different writing projects and things like that. Also, I'm getting ready. I'm packing up. Actually, Constance is packing up for me and, and uh, uh, getting my clothes and stuff ready for my trip to Denver uh, in just a few days for the OTO National Convention. And uh, this has been the first first time I've been stepped on an airplane uh, since uh, I returned from Santiago, Chile at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, so, uh, you know, I've been a hermit all this time, so I'll be, I'll be all crazy and agoraphobic and like an old doddering man. And I've been on my back and on my butt uh, and not uh, exercising for a long time. So, uh, getting me back in the world is going to be uh, quite a challenge. Now, uh, I'll appreciate your thoughts and prayers and your good vibes uh, sending my way. Also, I just got off the phone and it looks like uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, visiting Chicago in um, in October for a for a weekend of talks and things like that and I'll keep you posted on that as it uh, as things progress um, what I, in getting ready for all of this I, I'm I, I'm finding all sorts of uh, uh, very interesting uh, things uh, Every once in a while, okay, it's usually when I'm uh, uh, brought into town by uh, uh, some ov not overtly magical organization of some kind, like the Freemasons, the Scottish Rite or something, I'll be invited to speak uh, and come to uh, uh, town to, to speak on those sort of uh, not overtly esoteric matters and uh, they'll ask for a, a lecture sort of like a public public lecture just sort of introducing myself and and introducing uh, uh, briefly opening the door on the subject of of uh, magic and stuff and as far as the the organizations like the the Masons are concerned uh, it, it's a door that needs to be open because of uh, so much of uh, uh, Freemasonry is so rich with esoteric uh, traditions but you got to sort of open the door uh, uh, slowly <laughs> so I ran across one of these uh, uh, I call it uh, like a cold open introduction to uh, uh, to magic, something that I would do for a, uh, a non-esoteric crowd that's none, nonetheless at least uh, uh, on the surface uh, tolerant of uh, of this kind of stuff. So I'm going to going to share uh, this. I did at Douglas College. Uh, and I believe it's in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, a number of years ago. And I thought you'd get a kick out of it. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, just, uh, just enough to get us uh, a taste of it. My name is Lon Milo Duquette, and I'm here this evening to give a very brief introduction to the mystical and magical philosophy of Thelema and its prophet, Alistair Crowley. To put things in historic perspective, I'm going to spend a little time giving a brief overview to several of the most influential esoteric orders of the past and present. The word Thelema 
is one of several Greek words meaning will. The particular nuance of philema is suggestive of cosmic intent or human will that is in tune with what is commonly thought of as the will of God. Not so much as the, the God of any particular religion or cult, but the supreme, universal, cosmic, whatever it is. That is the foundation and support of existence itself. Most of the books of the New Testament of the Christian Bible were originally written in Greek. One example of how the Greek word thelema is used in the New Testament is in the Lord's Prayer, found in Matthew 6.10, where Jesus is quoted, Thy kingdom come, thy thelema is done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and the word will that they, uh, that they used was Thelema. Thy Thelema be done as earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Later, he uses it in the same gospel, uh, 2642, when he says, my, quote, my father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy Thelema be done. To understand Thelema, we first need to focus on the person and the magical work of Aleister Crowley, who was perhaps the world's most famous and influential ceremonial magician. We can't talk about Thelema or modern ceremonial magic without talking about this colorful character. I'm a ceremonial magician. I practice magic. My words tonight, the concepts I'll share and the opinions I'll voice are for me not merely theories, but are based upon knowledge and insights I've gained as the result of, of uh, 50 years of personal magical practices and meditations. Since the late 1980s, I've written extensively on magic, Kabbalah, and the Western mystery traditions such as Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. I also work with tarot cards. Now I have to add that uh, I believe that there was also, I had a PowerPoint slide presentation uh, where I was showing graphics and examples of the cards and pictures of Crowley and things like that. I also work with tarot cards, which in their own way represent magical and Kabbalistic principles of Western ceremonial magic. But I also have a very normal life. I'm a husband to my beautiful wife, Constance. We're high school sweethearts and have been married 50 years. So I guess this, uh, this speech was six years ago, at least six years ago. We have one son, Jean-Paul. Uh, who now lives with his family in China. He teaches at the University of Macau. I'm a professional musician. I'm a songwriter, an entertainer, and a recording artist. And for the last 22 years, have served as United States Deputy Grand Master General of Ordo Templi Orientis, a century-old magical society once led by Aleister Crowley. The OTO is currently the largest magical organization in the world. It is perhaps the single most influential magical society in history. Its membership is open to both men and women. It has five international grand lodges. There may be more now, I, I'm not sure. And has uh, local lodges and bodies in 26 countries around the world. The OTO was formed in 1900 in Germany by a group of high-degree Freemasons who wanted to explore more deeply ancient magical traditions and practices. The founders of the OTO were especially interested in the highly ecstatic practices of Sufi mystics of Persia and the tantric philosophies of the East. They saw a direct relationship between, quote, 
sacred sex, unquote, practices of the Eastern cultures and the Western mystical traditions associated with the quest of the Holy Grail. We may stop and ask here, why were all these high degree Freemasons interested in these exoteric magical practices? Freemasonry is a fraternity that existed long before its official birth in 1717 in England. It became wildly popular in Europe and the Americas. It encouraged the idea of brotherly love and the brotherhood of all people of all nations. Masonry teaches the virtues of honesty, education, logic, and science. Freemasonry cultivated some of the greatest minds in the world. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the leaders of the intellectual and social movement that we call the Enlightenment were Masons. The great Americans, Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and the French philosopher Voltaire were Masons. These men were revolutionary thinkers who were interested in liberating mankind from the oppression of uh, the monarchies and the church from social and political slavery. But they were also interested in liberating mankind spiritually. So certain high level Freemasons of the 18th, 19th and 20th century were also very interested in what is now labeled high magic. I'm a Freemason. My father was a Freemason too. It's a wonderful organization. Masonry's mystic ceremonies are inspiring, very beautiful, but they're not overtly magical in nature. And while certain Freemasons are magicians, Freemasonry does not teach magic. For a number of years, I was an active member of the Rosicrucian Order AMORC. AMORC provides a very good correspondence course on mystical principles of positive thinking and mind power and the wisdom of ancient philosophers. The Rosicrucians do not call their teachings magic, but they claim to be descended from the ancient European Rosicrucians and mystic Freemasons. These fanciful claims are not historically true, but I did learn a great deal from my Amorc studies and the experience uh, gave me a good foundation for my future magical training. The biggest advantage of AMORC is that their lessons come in the mail every week and you get to study and practice in the privacy of your home temple. My first introduction to Kabbalistic magic and tarot came with my involvement as a young man with the BOTA, the Builders of the Aditum. BOTA also teaches through correspondence courses delivered conveniently in the mail. Its founder, Paul Foster Case, was once an adept of the famous Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which I'll talk more about in a moment. I'd not have hesitate to recommend the BOTA lessons to anyone who wants to learn the Kabbalistic fundamentals of magic and tarot. Almost all these popular esoteric orders are connected either directly or indirectly from one highly influential order that existed for only about 25 years at the turn of the 20th century. You've probably heard about it, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Founded in 1888 by high degree British Freemasons, the Golden Dawn operated in a semi-secret manner and attracted some of the most famous and brilliant members of the British arts and sciences. The Golden Dawn taught magic in a very scientific and structured way. The degrees, ceremonies, and teachings were based on the Kabbalistic diagram, and then I projected a tree of life on the screen. 
Each of the ten circles or emanations on the tree represent a level of human consciousness. Each degree in the Golden Dawn was symbolic of one of these levels of consciousness and prepared the magician to actually expand his or her consciousness to achieve higher and higher levels of spiritual illumination. The original Golden Dawn disbanded in the early 1900s, but there are many groups around the world today that are trying to revive the work of this overtly magical order. Some of them, I believe, are doing good work. Others, I believe, are not. Belonging to a magical organization can be an educational and very helpful experience. But real magic is, is a personal and private matter. Everything you willfully do in life is magic. Magic isn't something you do, it's something you are. Real magic isn't performing illusions and tricks to entertain an audience. Real magic isn't using supernatural forces to gain control over other people. The only thing you can really change in magic is yourself. If you want to influence others, if you want to change the world, you must first master yourself. You must first become the type of enlightened person who can influence others. You must become the type of enlightened person whose life and actions will profoundly change the world. The magician uses, the ma uses magic to master himself or herself. The magician uses magic in order to harmonize his or her consciousness with the universal consciousness that is the underlying foundation of existence and being. The magician uses magic to harmonize his or her own personal will with the universal laws of the cosmos. Magic is a spiritual art form and every magician is an artist. As no two artists are alike, so too no magicians are alike. What exactly is magic? Well, magic is not a religion. Magic is not a belief system. Magic is not a political ideology or philosophy. Aleister Crowley defined magic as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. So technically, any willed action is an act of magic. Is it your will to brush your teeth? If so, brushing your teeth is magic. I know this definition doesn't sound very exciting or exotic. Perhaps my definition of magic might be a little more descriptive. This is mine. Magic is a dramatic spiritual art form that awakens potentially powerful forces and energies within ourselves. These forces and energies can be awakened and directed using the subtle powers of our own creative imagination and concentrated visualization. To, you do magic whenever you willfully effect a change in your consciousness. And changing your consciousness changes the world around you. I'm going to repeat that. Changing your consciousness changes the world around you. Ancient magicians were superstitious. They believed that magic worked because their lives were affected by the influence of gods, spirits, and devils, demons, and angels. Modern magicians understand magic from a more psychological and scientific point of view. We intellectually attribute magic's unexplainable powers and mysteries as phenomena occurring on the unseen quantum level of existence. Quantum physicists tells us, tell us that the ultimate nature of reality is consciousness. Time and space and matter and energy are ultimately aspects of consciousness. 
Physicists have demonstrated that the mere act of observing an event changes the conditions of the event. The Thelemic magician is a person who consciously and with full intent becomes the cosmic observer of his or her own existence. And by means of the various magical dramatic art forms set to work to create a better life, a better reality, and a better universe. To summarize, ancient magicians were superstitious and believed that our lives in the universe operated through the agencies and powers of gods, angels, demons, and spirits. But even though the ancient magicians were unscientific and superstitious, their magic sometimes worked. Modern magicians aren't superstitious, or shouldn't be. We view the gods, angels, demons, spirits as dramatic symbols or metaphors representing the natural psychic powers we all possess. And if we do things right, it works sometimes. That's where I'm going to leave it for today. I'll I go on uh, with that lecture. Anyway, I thought I thought you would sort of uh, enjoy uh, how I would approach uh, sort of speaking to kind of a white bread audience concerning magic. But anyway, that's it for today. Uh, I got a big day of sitting on my butt <laughs> ahead of me. So until tomorrow, uh, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.